Okay, I'd like to um, start off uh, the Wednesday afternoon lecture uh, series by introducing um, someone who is going to give us an absolutely spectacular talk today. Uh, this is Catherine Delac from Harvard University. Um, Catherine grew up in Montpellier, France. France. She's a French citizen, graduating from the Ecole um, the Ecole Normale Supérieure in Paris. Um, she then earned her PhD in developmental biology at the University of Paris in 1992. And then she moved to the US. She went to Columbia to work with Richard Axel. And that really set the stage for her, her long-term interest in pheromone receptors. Because with Richard, she identified the first genes encoding the mammalian pheromone receptors as a family. She then joined the faculty of Harvard in 1996 um, quickly establishing herself there in many big ways, uh, becoming an investigator of the Howard Hughes Medical Institute, and ultimately becoming chair of the, of the Department of Cell and Molecular Biology. Um, she, her lab continues and is uh, really the uh, world leader in understanding pheromone perception in mammals. And in particular, her lab is uh, really clarifying the molecular logic of olfactory signaling underlying the coding of pheromone-mediated signals um, by, by uh, in particular, mice. She is uh, a member of the French Academy of Sciences, based on all her spectacular work. She won the Lansbury Award from the American um, Association of Sciences and is uh, a member of that society. Um, please welcome me for uh, welcome me for welcoming um, Catherine to um, NIH today. And today she's going to share with us uh, her very exciting work related to um, how uh, pheromones control sex in animals and how that is uh, wired in. Catherine. Thanks, Jennifer, for the very kind introduction, and thanks for inviting me. Thanks for um, offering me the opportunity to talk about my work and organizing a terrific visit. I don't know if my slide is going to show up. So the title of my talk is Sex Battles um, in the Brain. And actually, um, I'm not going to talk about pheromone signaling today. I'm going to talk about a different sex battle. So um, most of my lab is indeed, as Jennifer mentioned, um, working on um, innate behavior and uh, what, what are the circuits that underlie male-specific, female-specific behavior. Um, but what I will be talking about today is a, a different sex battle. Um, and uh, the commonality, I think, of the two projects, uh, pheromone signaling and, and what I uh, will be telling you today, is really this uh, intricate relationship between the information provided by the genome and the animal behavior. Uh, obviously, uh, genes uh, influence behavior through the development of the brain, through the type of signaling and modulation happening in the brain. And uh, a very uh, interesting phenomenon that we were um, uh, interested recently, that we start to investigate recently, um, is a sex battle across generation that uh, originates from the fact that every cell in our genome receives a complement of gene from the maternal genome and another set from the paternal genome. And interestingly, these two genomes, although uh, identical, um, actually do not provide identical information to the cell. So in mammals, um, cells express certain genes only from the maternal or the paternal genome. And this is a phenomenon called genomic imprinting that we've recently studied in the adult and developing brain. Now, why is this a sex battle? Well, interestingly, not only uh, the information provided by the maternal and the paternal genome is not identical, but actually is sometimes in conflict with each other. And it's this uh, battle um, that I will be telling about, I will, I will be describing today. Basically, the bottom line of the 
of my talk is that even in your, in your brain as adult, uh, your mom and your dad keep telling you what to do and they basically don't necessarily agree with each other on what you should be doing. Um, so the good news is then you can do whatever you want since uh, they are telling you different things. So what is the phenomenon of genomic imprinting? Why do we think it's important for the brain? So the uh, phenomenon of genomic imprinting has a very simple definition. It's the differential expression of the maternal versus the paternal allele of certain genes. It's a phenomenon that has been identified relatively recently in the 80s um, when um, early Mars embryologists uh, were uh, doing some interesting experiment and generated what are called parthenotes and andronauts, um, which are uh, zygotes in which either the maternal or the paternal nucleus has been removed right after fertilization and replaced by a second pronucleus of the same kind. So these generates uh, embryos that have a duplication of the maternal genome or a duplication of the paternal genome. So these are called paternodes and these are called andronodes. Now interestingly, in contrast to normal wild-type zygotes that have both information from mom and dad, these paternodes and andronodes do not give rise to viable embryos, so uh, these are lethals. Now, this was quite surprising when it was discovered because, um, as you know, all the genes are duplicates between the maternal and the paternal genome, and so these indicate that there is a complementarity between the maternal and the paternal genome that was not appreciated before. And um, this complementarity, this required complementarity, comes from the fact that some genes are exclusively expressed from the maternal or the paternal genome, and therefore both parental genomes are required for normal development. And the idea behind this phenomenon is that already at the stage of the gametes, the chromosomes originating from mom or from dad have very specific marks. Some of those marks are likely to involve DNA methylation, but there might be other types of marks that are unknown. And therefore, um, in the gametes already, but uh, later on, after fertilization, a cell will always know whether a gene is originating from mom and from dad, and these genes have sometimes different expression. Um, as of um, uh, recently, uh, about 80 imprinted genes had been known in the mouse. Um, about 30% uh, are non-coding RNA, and computer, computer studies had predicted about the existence of about 500 imprinted genes in the genome. Now, the phenomenon of genomic imprinting is, is very uh, paradoxical uh, to some extent. Uh, first, it's a very recent event, evolutionary. Uh, the phenomenon of genomic imprinting has been identified only in placental mammals and flowering plants, uh, so we, which are uh, organisms that uh, emerged relatively recently, evolutionary. And these really raise an interesting question, which is, um, why would it be advantageous, evolutionary, um, to have this phenomenon in which one copy of essential genes is shut down um, in this phenomenon of genomic imprinting? What could be the advantage of an organism um, to um, uh, uh, um, silence uh, an, an extra copy of some essential gene when having two copies could be a, an absolutely terrific safety mechanism uh, in case some mutation or something happened to one of the two copies. So what the advantage of shutting down one of the two parental copies? And um, in the early 90s, um, an evolutionary biologist at Harvard, David Haig and collaborators, um, proposed a very interesting theory called the kinship or parental conflict theory uh, to explain what is unique to mammals that could have led to this phenomenon of genomic imprinting. And um, the idea is the following. What is very unique to mammals is the fact that the embryo is in neutral for a long period of time and therefore has direct access to maternal resources. And this, in turn, generates a conflict between the paternal and the maternal genome. The paternal genome wants the embryo to take, uh, 
take as much resources from mom as possible, such that his progeny, dad's progeny, are uh, thriving as much as possible. But mom, obviously, wants to keep uh, the embryonic growth um, in check, and in particular, keep enough resources to have progeny, all the progenies later on. However, uh, about 90 or 95 percent of mammals are promiscuous, and therefore, all the progeny from mom are likely to originate from another dad. So dad number one obviously has no interest in mom having progeny from dad number two, number three, etc. And so this generates this conflict between the paternal genome that wants to advantage its own progeny and the maternal genome that wants to have embryos from different dads. And so the idea is that paternally expressed genes will tend to enhance embryonic growth, and maternally expressed genes will tend to decrease embryonic growth. Now, amazingly, this uh, theory was emitted before the first imprinted genes were actually discovered. And when they were discovered, they fit exactly uh, this uh, conflict theory. So the first paternally expressed gene that was discovered is IGF2. Um, it's a growth factor that promotes embryonic growth. And again, it's exclusively paternally expressed in the embryo. And the first maternally expressed gene that was discovered is IGF2 receptor. IGF2 receptor is maternally expressed. It's a truncated receptor that acts as an anti-growth factor. So you can see here these two genes acting in conflict with each other, one trying to promote embryonic growth, the other one trying to restrict embryonic growth. And since then, quite a number of imprinted genes uh, have been identified that seem to play similar roles in uh, fitting with the growth of the embryo. Not all of them um, uh, appear to fit with this theory, but a relatively large number of them. Moreover, um, about half of the known imprinted genes have been knocked out, and um, one can look at the effect of uh, gene inactivation, and the most frequent phenotype that is observed um, affect embryonic growth, with indeed paternally expressed uh, genes being growth promoter and maternally expressed genes being growth repressor. Now, the second most frequent phenotype that is observed affects behavioral and neurological function. And if you think about it, there is really no reason to believe that this conflict between mom and dad in the genome should really stop when the embryo is born. In other words, the pup has uh, feeding behavior, um, exploratory behavior, social behavior in general that could also be modulated by the differential expression of genes between the maternal and the paternal genome. So um, a question that uh, we, we start to um, elaborate on uh, together with uh, David Haig is whether uh, there could also be some parental conflict in the brain and whether uh, imprinted genes could indeed play, play an important role um, in the development and the function of the brain. And um, the existence of some syndromes in humans uh, already seem to illustrate the idea that imprinted gene could indeed not only be very important for the normal function of the brain, but actually have really interesting functions related to feeding behavior, social behavior, motivation behavior. And uh, one of the most famous set of uh, mutation with parental effects, so mutation that affect imprinted genes, are um, the so-called Prado-Willi and Angelman syndrome. Now, these two syndromes are extremely interesting because they affect exactly the same cluster of genes, but in Prado-Willi, the deletion of this cluster originates from dad, and in Angelman syndrome, the deletion of the cluster originates from mom, and the phenotype of these two type of patients is extraordinarily different from each other. So here is the uh, cluster of genes that is um, deleted in these two syndromes, and this cluster contains quite a number of genes. Two of them are known to be exclusively maternally expressed, ATP10A and UB3A, and a number of genes represented here in blue are exclusively paternally expressed. And it's because of this that the phenotype of um, the mutation originating from mom and dad is so different. So this is Prado-Willi syndrome, this is Angelman syndrome. In Prado-Willi syndrome, 
The deletion is inherited from that, so none of the blue genes here can be expressed, and only these uh, uh, two maternally expressed genes can be expressed from the cluster. So the Prado really has a maternal bias, and vice versa, in Angelman syndrome, none of the genes indicated in red uh, are inherited, and therefore only the paternally expressed gene can be uh, expressed. In Prado Willi, the infants show hyperphagia after weaning, impaired sensitivity to pain, frequent crying and tantrum, psychosis. In Angelman, the phenotype is very different. They show trusting personality, frequent lover, and autistic features. And in the case of Angelman syndrome, it is thought that uh, the majority of these uh, sim um, uh, phenotypes actually originate from the deletion of a single gene, which is UB3A. But in the case of Prado Willi, it's not really very clear yet which one or which ones of these genes um, um, play a role in, in um, this phenotype. Now, um, as you can see, uh, the functions that are affected in, in these two individuals relate to social behavior, feeding behavior. It's quite interesting. And uh, more generally, some hypotheses have been set on proposed on the involvement of imprinted loci in more generally in mental disorders and in particular autism and schizophrenia. Now, um, this is all uh, very interesting. Um, and, but one, one question we um, really wonder is um, how important are really imprinted genes beside this particular uh, uh, human syndrome? And we decided to uh, perform an in silico experiment to just check whether there was something special about the expression of imprinted genes in the mouse brain. So. Um, Basically, um, the idea was that if imprinted genes indeed play um, some specific role in homeostatic uh, function of the brain, such as the control of feeding behavior, or more generally in social behavior, then the prediction would be that imprinted genes are more specifically expressed in certain brain areas compared to all the other genes, the, the genes that are uh, expressed in a bilalic manner. And so we perform an in silico experiment uh, using the data from the Paul Allen Brain Atlas that map all the expression pattern of all the mouse genes um, in the mouse brain. And we looked at where are non-imprinted genes um, sh found to be expressed in various brain areas. So uh, this is a sample of the data. Um, each line is a different brain area. Each column represents a different imprinted genes. Um, if the, the imprinted gene is not expressed, it's shown by uh, a gray square. If the gene is expressed and it's maternally expressed, it's shown in pink. If it's expressed and paternally expressed, it's shown in blue. And what you can see here is that um, if you compare these three brain areas, one particular brain area has almost no uh, imprinted gene being expressed. So this is a cold spot in this heat map of imprinted gene expression. Some has like a moderate amount uh, expressed. And some are hot spot for imprinted gene expression, which is this uh, area in which imprinted genes seem to be preferentially expressed. So when we do this analysis over all the non-imprinted genes, over almost 120 uh, brain area, we represent basically all the, the um, uh, topographically, uh, topographically uh, identified brain area. Um, we get a data like this. Um, obviously, you cannot see the detail, but let me just give you um, an, an overview of it. So what you have here in green is the expression pattern of randomly picked biologically uh, expressed genes. So these are just regular genes, non-imprinted genes. And as you can see, some of these genes are highly expressed in certain brain areas. So the hotspot of uh, biologic gene expression are located here. And interestingly, these correspond to the cortex. Um, this is actually expected. The cortex is a very uh, heterogeneous uh, brain area in terms of cell types. And therefore, this is an area in which there's a lot of different genes being expressed. That's not exactly surprising. Now, here are maternally expressed genes that are ubiquitously expressed. These are paternally expressed genes that are ubiquitously expressed. And here are more interesting imprinted genes that are expressed only in some brain areas. And so if you look at the extreme left here in uh, the statistical uh, analysis, 
of the imprinted gene expression in some brain areas, you can see that there are indeed some brain areas that are hotspots for imprinted gene expression here and here, and those are very different from the hotspot of biallelic gene expression. And interestingly, if you look at the nature of these brain areas, those are brain areas that are all involved in social behavior, motivation behavior, and homeostasis, and in particular, feeding, energy expenditure, thermal regulation, pain, stress, reward, mating, and maternal behavior. So there's a very defined and, and very specific set of brain function uh, that seem to be associated with imprinted genes. So that's extraordinarily interesting and, and really uh, motivated us to um, look more in details at what are the, uh, are there more imprinted genes that uh, what is being described here and um, are uh, the imprinted genes uh, repertoire in one brain area similar to the imprinted repertoire of another brain area? Now, based on this, obviously, there's quite a number of brain areas we could be looking at. And, and a difficult question is, well, how do we start? What brain area should we be looking at more in detail? And here, we turn to a very interesting study uh, that had been published by the group of Barry Cavern as many years ago. Um, that really pointed our attention to three very specific brain areas in which um, uh, uh, the phenomenon of genomic imprinting could be particularly interesting and different from one brain area or the other. And, and this is uh, what I'm going to be describing to you. Uh, so again, these experiments are due to the work of Barry Kevern that was published in the mid-90s. So as I mentioned to you, if you try to generate zygotes that have a duplication of the paternal or the maternal genome, these zygotes uh, do not give rise to embryos. They, they are little. However, what you can do is to generate chimeras um, in which these uh, partenodes and andronodes are surrounded by wild-type embryonic cells. And these chimeras actually um, are able to develop and, and they give rise to embryos and individuals that you can analyze for the contribution of these cells that have paternal and, and maternal contribution. Now, um, very interestingly, this chimeric brain demonstrates different maternal and paternal contribution to brain structure, meaning these cells and these cells do different things. So what do they do? Well, first of all, at the level of the embryo, um, this is a normal embryo made out of uh, cells with a, uh, with a normal maternal and paternal contribution. But if you look at an embryo in which there are cells with a duplication of the paternal genome, something very interesting emerged, which is cells that have uh, embryos that have cells with a duplication of the paternal genome have a large body and a small brain. And in contrast, and, and women love this experiment, um, <laughs> embryos that have cells with a duplication of the maternal genome have a small body and a large brain. So what that tells us is something quite interesting, which is that the development of the brain seems to be using preferentially maternal information over paternal information. And things get even more interesting if one look at the development of this brain structure and look at where the cells with the duplication of the paternal or the maternal genome are contributing to. So um, cells with the duplication of the paternal genome go exclusively to hypothalamic area and avoid entirely the cortical area. Whereas, whereas cells with a duplication of the maternal genome go exclusively to the cortex and avoid entirely the hypothalamus. Now, Barry Kivern's explanation, which you may buy or not, was that, well, you know, dad only thinks about sex, and that's what the hypothalamus is doing, so that's why the paternal genome is so important here, and mom um, is highly involved in social interaction through maternal behavior, etc., and that's why the maternal behavior, the maternal genome is so important to, to the cortex. Now, I have to say, I was reading this uh, uh, experiment, these papers, when, you know, Larry Summers, the previous uh, uh, president of Harvard, was making comments on women not being able to do math, and obviously uh, that was just very... Uh, um, delight, I was delighted to, to read this. We, we call this the Summers experiment for quite a while.
sorry. In any case, um, let me show you the data, because I think the primary data are actually extremely impressive. You know, this is not a small effect. What you see here in black are cells that originate, that have a duplication of the paternal genome versus cells with a duplication of the maternal, uh, sorry, cells with a duplication of the paternal genome here in the hypothalamus compared to the cortex. You see it's, it's really almost black and, not, and, and white. And, and here this is uh, cells with a duplication of the maternal genome found preferentially in the cortex and not at all in the hypothalamus. So no matter what uh, the Kavan's explanation or interpretation of this, I think for me um, what is absolutely striking is how different the contribution of the maternal and the paternal genome are during brain development and then in different brain structures. And so the uh, next set of experiments that we decided to do was to look in depth at the repertoire of imprinted genes in the E15 brain, in the adult hypothalamus, more specifically the preoptic area, and the adult cortex, more specifically the medial, pre the medial prefrontal cortex. And the expectation from uh, this karmic experiment is that we should see a preferential expression of the maternal genome in the embryonic brain, a preferential expression of the paternal genome in the hypothalamus, and of the maternal genome in the adult cortex. So the experiment that we did took advantage of uh, two uh, fundamental ideas. Uh, one, which is uh, an experimental tool that has been used a lot in the imprinting field, which is the ability to recognize genes expressed from the maternal or the paternal genome by crossing um, uh, two mouse strains, here C57, C57 and Castaneous, uh, that are very distinct from each other, have diverged a long time ago evolutionary, and therefore in which uh, each gene, the expression of each gene can be recognized as originating from the paternal or the maternal genome according to a number of SNPs. And so we are looking at the transcriptome of um, tissues dissected from F1 cross between C57 and Castaneous and a reciprocal F1 in which now uh, dad is Castaneous and mom is C57. So we can easily recognize whether a gene is expressed biallelically from both maternal and paternal allele or whether it's expressed from only the paternal or the maternal allele and we can recognize whether this monoallelic expression correspond to a species effect or a parental effect by looking at the expression in the reciprocal cross. So the expectation is that uh, there is a preferential expression from one of the two allele and this is not linked to the species from which it originates from but from uh, the parent of origin of the allele. Uh, we um, analyzed this transcriptome of F1 and reciprocal F1 uh, using deep sequencing of the entire transcriptome of the preoptic area, the medial prefrontal cortex, the E15 brain from the two parental strain, Castaneous and C57, in order to get our uh, list of SNPs, as well as the F1 hybrid and reciprocal hybrid. Uh, we um, perform a very deep coverage, 25 to 34 coverage of each transcriptome, and we have very good control of the parental bias. Uh, we uh, were able to find that over 99.6% of the SNPs of mitochondrially expressed loci and over 97% of X-linked expressed loci in males are correctly called maternal, and we also find very robust identification of non-imprinted genes. So this is an example of paternally and maternally expressed genes. These are known imprinted genes. So this um, is the number of reads in the F1 and reciprocal F1 from each of the two alleles here, the maternal allele and the paternal allele. You can see in this cross, the paternal allele, which is here C57, is um, exclusively expressed. And in the reciprocal cross, um, the paternal allele is now castaneous and is also preferentially expressed. So this is a clear paternally expressed gene, and here we have uh, the uh, maternally expressed gene, as you can see, maternal allele, maternal allele, and almost no expression from the paternal allele. So um, we've analyzed this data, and um, this was published uh, uh, two months ago uh, in Science, and the results were uh, extremely interesting and extremely surprising. The first surprise really came from the sheer number of genes that we identify um, that show imprinted features. So from the original 80 genes known to be imprinted in the, in the mouse, we now have identified 1,300 genes uh, with imprinted features. Um, these can be split in two categories, uh, the genes that were found in the UCSC database, so corresponding to coding genes, um, 
a little bit over half of them, about 800 of those genes, and about 700 of genes uh, found in the functional RNA da database, which are uh, non-coding RNA. This is extremely interesting um, because the phenomenon of imprinting in many cases seem to be involving the function of non-coding RNA to silence in, in cis um, some uh, coding genes. So we think that this is a very interesting reservoir of uh, potential regulators of the imprinting phenomenon. Now, uh, what is very important is that the mean parental bias is extremely high. It's 90%, which would mean uh, for one particular SNP, there would be 10 reads from the maternal genome and 90 reads from the paternal genome. So this is an extremely robust phenomenon. We don't see all gradation from equal expression from maternal and paternal allele to um, uh, all over to total silencing of one or the other. At the SNP level, the parental bias that we see is, is extremely, um, uh, extremely robust. And also, very importantly, these results are very reproducible across independent biological samples. Um, we used uh, two uh, replicates um, in, in the original uh, SOLEXA analysis. Uh, we also confirm um, the um, imprinting status of many genes um, using PCR-based methods, so independent, independently from SOLEXA sequencing, and those were across uh, five independent biological samples, and we were able to confirm those results. So again, this is very reproducible um, across individuals. So these imprinted genes are found uh, all over the chromosomes. They are really spread throughout the genome. And so these first set of results really indicate that the phenomenon of genomic imprinting really is a major form of epigenetic regulation in the brain. Now, things became even further interesting when we looked at the distribution of uh, these imprinted genes in uh, the um, uh, uh, adult and embryonic brain. But before that, let me show you one um, example of, of a new data that, that we found, new imprinted genes that we found. So these you've seen, this, this is a cluster, uh, the prado willi uh, Angelman cluster with maternally and paternally expressed genes. And in that cluster, we actually identify a new set of nine transcripts uh, that are shown here that are all very robustly paternally expressed. And uh, these are the data on one of them called uh, DOCIS4. Um, here are the data with Illumina. You can see it's exclusively paternally expressed and confirmed with sequinome, which is a PCR-based approach. So this is quite interesting because, as I mentioned to you, in Prado Willi, it's not really clear what are the genes that are responsible for the various phenotype of, of the patient. And we have here a reservoir of, of nine new uh, candidate genes. So now, let me switch to the imprintome of the E15 brain and, and uh, the adult brain. Um, here are the data. Um, these are genes that are found imprinted at E15 versus the preoptic area versus the prefrontal cortex are indicated the number of uh, maternally expressed gene here in red and paternally expressed gene in blue. Now, those results are very interesting because, as you can see, at E15, exactly as predicted by the Kamek experiment, you can see twice as many maternally expressed genes than paternally expressed genes. So, indeed, it seems that the maternal contribution is, um, uh, is, is a major contribution compared to paternal contribution in uh, the embryonic brain. In contrast, in the adult brain, we see twice as many paternally expressed genes in the preoptic area um, than maternally expressed gene, but we also find this in the cortex. So this actually uh, only partially confirmed the data obtained with the chimeric, um, um, the chimeric mice, in which the prediction was that the paternal genome was more important for the preoptic area, but not for the cortex. What we found here is that uh, the contribution of the paternal genome is actually major in both adult structure, the preoptic area and the prefrontal cortex. And I'll tell you a little bit later, what is the maternal contribution uh, to the adult cortex, which uh, we found somewhere else. So what that tells us is already something quite interesting, which is that there is a major maternal influence on brain development and a major paternal influence over the adult brain function of offspring. Now, things became really um, uh, even more fascinating when we looked at what are the genes here that are found here and, and over here, <clears throat> and where are they imprinted? And what we found is that in contrast to the expectation with imprinted genes, where, you know, when a gene is imprinted, then it's imprinted throughout the organism, 
um, and in all the different tissues and, and developmental stage of the organism, what we found in contrast is that the vast majority of the genes with imprinted features that we identify are found imprinted in only one brain area. For example, here in green are genes that are found imprinted only at E15, here, or in blue, only imprinted in the preoptic area, or only imprinted in the prefrontal cortex. And there are only very few shown in, in those colors here, red and brown and, and dark blue and, and purple, uh, that are found imprinted in more than one brain area, two or three brain areas. Now, I should point out that these genes here, for 85% of them, are expressed throughout those brain areas, the three brain areas. In other words, it's not like they are expressed in one brain area and imprinted and not expressed in the other brain area. What's happening is that they are imprinted in one brain area and expressed but not imprinted, so biallelic in the other brain areas. And so <clears throat> what, what this suggests is that the phenomenon of genomic imprinting in the brain is both spatially and temporally regulated. So this is both a surprise and not a surprise. So the idea that some genes are imprinted in some tissues and not others is actually not new. Um, there is in the literature quite a number, maybe a handful of genes that have been found to be monoallelic, let's say in the embryo and not in the adult or monoallelic only in the adult brain and, and nowhere else. So the idea that the gene is not necessarily imprinted throughout an entire organism, throughout its entire life, this is not new. However, those genes were considered to be the exception. And what we think is that it's quite the opposite. Most of the genes are found monoallelic in some places and biallelic in other areas. So this really uh, presents the phenomenon of genomic imprinting in a, quite a different light than uh, what was thought before. Now, this is, I think, a fascinating example in what is a canonical example of imprinted gene, IGF-2, which I mentioned is, was the first paternally expressed gene that was, that was uh, discovered. And so, um, um, in this locus um, of IGF-2, sorry, um, you have two genes, IGF-2 and H19. Uh, H19 is, in, is a non-coding RNA, and what's happening is that there is a unique enhancer that will interact with either H19 or IGF2 according to the methylation pattern of an imprinting control region which is uh, located in the middle of the two genes here. So in other words, um, um, in the embryo, and, and this has been worked out very nicely uh, by, by uh, many, uh, many groups, in, in the E15 embryo, um, you have, this is uh, the peak of expression of the two genes, so both IGF2 and uh, H19 are expressed, and as expected, um, H19 is maternally expressed and IGF2 is paternally expressed. And, and these are the Solexa data, um, as you can see, IGF2 being paternally expressed both through Illumina and Sequinon. Now, um, surprisingly, when we look at the adult, then we found something quite different, which is in the adult, only IGF2 is expressed, and we don't see any expression of H19. But interestingly, um, uh, IGF2 is actually not paternally expressed uh, any longer, it's actually maternally expressed. In other words, there is a switch from being paternal to being maternal, and this has never uh, been um, identified before. Here are the data. Uh, you can see maternal expression here uh, in the prefrontal cortex, in the preoptic area, both through Illumina and Sequinol. And I would like to point your attention to the fact that the, um, the bias, the maternal bias in the adult is actually more robust um, uh, in this direction than the paternal bias in the embryo. So I, I think this is a very remarkable uh, phenomenon. This is another uh, switch of, of the uh, imprinting status of another gene in a very interesting cluster of genes that contain uh, dopamine decarboxylase, uh, located here, GRB10, which is a signaling molecule important for development and neuronal signaling, and cordon bleu, which is a gene involved in um, uh, embryonic development. And uh, as you can see, dopamine decarboxylase is found maternally expressed. Uh, cordon bleu is also found maternally expressed in the preoptic area in E15. But interestingly, GRB10 is found strictly uh, paternally expressed in the preoptic area and strictly maternally expressed uh, at E15. 
And these are the data here. You switch from maternal expression to a strictly paternal expression in the adult. So again, there is this very interesting switch of the origin um, of, of the gene expression that is occurring. Now, we also found some genes that are uh, found imprinted only in males or only in females. Um, we found 150 of them uh, in the prefrontal cortex and over 190 of them in the preoptic area. Um, these are the data. Uh, these are the maternal and paternal contribution in the preoptic area. And you can see that were found imprinted in uh, very specifically in the female preoptic area and that uh, the majority of them are paternally expressed uh, with fewer maternally expressed. Now, this importance of the female preoptic area uh, is quite interesting because um, imprinted genes have been known through a number of mutants to influence maternal behavior and, and it is well known that the female preoptic area is involved in the control of maternal behavior. Now, I found this phenomenon of spe sex-specific imprinting absolutely fascinating uh, for a number of reasons. First, uh, there's this interesting idea that uh, dad is still trying to keep control of the hypothalamic function of the daughter, uh, which has a, a kind of Freudian kind of uh, thing uh, to it. Um, but I think, uh, you know, more generally and more seriously, um, I think these provide an extraordinary interesting reservoir of um, susceptibility genes. As you know, um, there's a very large number of mental disorders that um, display very different prevalence in men and women. Uh, autism, schizophrenia, um, uh, eating disorders, you name it. And here you have a phenomenon in which some genes are actually biallelic in one sex and monoallelic in the other sex. And obviously, uh, these could provide extremely interesting uh, candidates for disease susceptibility. I'm going to show you a couple of examples that I think are quite fascinating. So, <clears throat> these. Um, is uh, the uh, uncoupling uh, protein 2, um, which is uh, a gene that um, might be involved in regulation of metabolism. And uh, <clears throat> as you can see, it's preferentially paternally expressed in female and biallelic in males. This is a susceptibility gene for multiple sclerosis and uh, diabetes in females. Um, this um, myelin oligodendrocyte uh, basic protein is found also paternally expressed only in females, biallelic in men. This is a susceptibility gene for multiple sclerosis. Uh, this is uh, deacid glycerol acid transferase 2. Again, um, uh, preferential paternal expression in female, not in male. This is a tubity gene for disease in females. And these are um, uh, two ion channels that uh, lead to neurodevelopmental and neurodegenerative disorders. So uh, overall, these are obviously extremely uh, interesting genes. I would like to point out to one specific gene that uh, we found uh, very interesting, interleukin-18. Um, which we found uh, also displaying sex-specific imprinting in the prefrontal cortex. Interleukin-18 is a cytokine expressed in the, in the brain. Um, it has been linked to neuroinflammation, multiple sclerosis, um, and uh, there is a mutant. And, and the mutant mice are uh, hypophagic. Now, here's the thing. Because there is a mutant, and because we found this gene to be um, uh, only imprinted in females, the expectation would be that female heterozygous that inherit um, um, female heterozygous would be also hyperphagic if they inherit the mutation uh, only from one of the two parents, uh, but not both. And interestingly, when we went into the literature, there was absolutely no report um, in the results section of the phenotype of the heterozygous. And it's only in the methods that it says, well, um, some female heterozygous uh, were found to be hypophagic. And we think that uh, the investigator never thought about looking at whether the crosses um, that to establish this heterozygous animal, whether the crosses used uh, uh, um, a male or a female mutant, and therefore the parent of origin of the mutation was uh, never kept track of. Um, but, but these are the data, as you can see, um, maternal expression in female, but no preferential maternal expression in, in, in male, and in the protic area, uh, preferential paternal expression. So these are the animals, and we've not done uh, analysis yet of um, 
uh, of what's happening in the brain, uh, but we just confirm uh, the data and the fact that there is indeed a prefrontal expression of the maternal allele in um, the prefrontal cortex and not in the hypothalamus. So this is a very interesting, important experiment because all the data I have presented so far are obtained using crosses between Castanus and C57, which are extremely distantly related mouse line. And you can say, well, you know, maybe there's something abnormal in, in crossing these very distant mice. But these are um, just with regular um, uh, lab mice, C57 mice, um, so there's not this weirdness of, of these two uh, different genomes. And what we are looking at are the expression when the heterozygous inherit the mutation from mom or from dad. And <clears throat> the, um, uh, the expectation, obviously, is that if there is a preferential expression from uh, the maternal genome, over the paternal genome and in female in the prefrontal area, then you should see a distinct uh, difference in expression when you look at the mutation inherited from mom and from dad. And this is exactly what we found. We found this only in the prefrontal cortex and only in the female. So it's a beautiful genetic demonstration, I think, of our results. <coughs> Now, let me switch now to one chromosome I haven't talked so far about, which is the X chromosome. And um, everything I uh, told you so far relate to the autosomes, but the X chromosome is actually an extraordinarily interesting chromosome as far as uh, brain function is concerned. Um, first, uh, it, it does not contain a lot of coding genes, uh, but among those genes um, is the highest ratio of neural genes over any autosome. And indeed, uh, cognitive impairments have been linked three times more frequently with X-linked genes compared to autosomal genes. So in other words, the X chromosome, although it does not have a lot of genes, um, has a disproportionate amount of genes related to the brain. So it's obviously a very interesting uh, uh, gene to look at. Um, and in particular, the maternal and the paternal contribution of the X chromosome in females. Males only have the maternal X chromosome, but uh, females have both maternal and paternal X. And when we looked, <coughs> sorry, when we looked at the expression of the X-linked genes, both in the prefrontal cortex and in the preoptic area in the adult, we found something very curious, which is that it seems that um, the, the, the level of expression of the X-linked genes originating from the maternal X was much higher than the expression level of uh, genes originating from the paternal X. In other words, there seemed to be a prefrontal expression of the maternal X over the paternal X, mainly in the cortex and a little bit in the preoptic area as well. So this was just very curious, and, and we tried to find an independent method to confirm, to, to try to investigate more in depth what was going on. And for this, we um, looked at a mouse model, a transgenic mouse, uh, in which a GFP reporter is inserted into one of the X chromosome. And so um, when you have uh, heterozygous females, um, you can, um, if the GFP is originating from mom or originating from dad, you can actually visualize by the presence of fluorescence which of the X chromosome is active and, and which one is inactivated. So if you look at various tissue, for example, the skin or the muscle or the heart, um, you can see both in uh, maternal and paternal X carrying the GFP, you can see this random mosaic indicating um, the activated and inactivated X chromosome. But interestingly, if you look in the brain, uh, there's something different emerging. And in the cortex in particular, um, there seem to be a very clear uh, overabundance of green cells when the GFP is carried by the maternal X over the paternal X. And you can see here, there's a 30% difference in the number of cells expressing the maternal X over the paternal X chromosome. Here's the prefrontal cortex and sensory cortex. We actually looked at five independent cortical areas and, and we confirmed these results. And in contrast, if, you, if we look at the hypothalamus, um, uh, we found 50-50 of the number of cells expressing the maternal and the paternal X. And I have to tell you that uh, uh, on Sunday, I actually got an email from a woman who um, is uh, uh, um, involved in a foundation uh, 
uh, relate to Red syndrome. Red syndrome is an X-linked disease. And obviously she had a huge interest in the idea that um, according to um, uh, the preferential expression of the maternal and the paternal X, obviously um, uh, the disease might have different severity. And apparently in Red syndrome, 90% of the sporadic case actually originate from that. So uh, uh, obviously there would be a huge interest to understand uh, why the maternal X is actually preferentially expressed over the paternal X and, and maybe do something uh, potentially uh, to patients. But in any case, what these results indicate is that there is a major maternal influence over the cortical function of daughters through the X chromosome. So um, if I, I summarize uh, these uh, sets of results, what we found is that there's a paternal brain and a maternal brain, and the paternal brain is the adult brain, where there's a, a preferential um, expression of uh, paternally expressed gene, uh, so a major influence of uh, the paternal genome over the adult brain function of offspring. And the influence of mom goes through uh, uh, different mechanisms. One is the preferential expression of maternal uh, gene in the embryonic brain, and also in the daughters at least, uh, this uh, preferential expression of the maternal X chromosome, at least uh, in the cortex. So let me um, uh, go quickly over the, the last uh, bit of data that I would like to show you. I think there is something uh, very unique uh, also in, in the, the analysis that we've done, and that's the um, uh, very high resolution, the SNP level resolution of the phenomenon of genomic imprinting, which is uh, provided that high, by high throughput sequencing and had never been achieved so far in the analysis of genomic imprinting. So, Basically, what we are looking at uh, is this phenomenon of parental bias, so genomic imprinting, at the SNP level, which occurs um, for many genes in several locations of the gene. So, for example, this gene here has five different SNPs, and we can look at the ex respective expression of the paternal and the maternal uh, gene uh, over these five different SNPs, as you can see here in um, both crosses in each of the SNP, there is an equal amount of gene expressed from the maternal and the paternal allele. This is a very clearly uh, biallelic gene. In contrast, this is also a gene that has five different SNPs, and at each of the SNP, you can easily recognize this very clear maternal bias uh, in, in each of the SNPs. So this is a very clear maternally expressed gene. But in many cases, um, this is not what we see. What we see is what we, we call a complex situation, or complex genes, uh, such as this one here, in which this is a gene that has four different SNPs. And as you can see, over the first two SNPs here, this one and this one, there is a very clear maternal bias in the expression of those SNPs. But in the last two SNPs here, located here, there is a very clear paternal bias in gene expression. So how can that be? How can you have one part of the gene with a maternal bias and the other part a paternal bias? Well, in many cases, we don't know what's happening. In that particular case, actually, we think we have the explanation, and it's uh, because of the following. These genes has actually several transcripts, and the two SNPs that are located here are unique to one particular transcript, so these are located in this exon here um, that <clears throat> is very specific of this shorter transcript, and these SNPs here are exclusively paternally expressed, suggesting that this short transcript here is actually exclusively paternally expressed. Now, in contrast, the other two SNPs here are common between uh, this long and this shorter transcript, and these show a mix of both paternal expression and maternal expression. And we think that what's happening is that this long transcript is actually exclusively maternally expressed, and so these two SNPs here reflect the expression of both transcripts, whereas these SNPs here uh, um, uh, show the bias of only uh, the shorter transcript. Now, I want to point out to the fact that this is actually uh, the case for the majority of the data that we have obtained. Uh, we call uh, genes in which all the SNP agree consensus gene, uh, SNPs in which there is a disagreement between SNPs, complex genes, and, and these are genes in which there is only one SNP, so we don't know whether there is a conflict or not. I would like to point out that the known genes, so the, the AD genes um, that had already been identified as imprinted, well, half of them are uh, show consensus, but half, actually a little bit over half, 
show a complex situation. So, um, and among our data, the vast majority of the new gene that we found show this uh, complex situation. So, um, uh, I think the phenomenon of genomic imprinting is really much more complex than what had been appreciated before. Now, what is this originating from? Well, in most of the case, we actually don't know. But for about a quarter of the case, what we found is that the SNPs are either uh, localized strictly to one particular exon or to the three prime UTR or both of them. And let me show you a couple of examples. This, for example, is a, a simple locus, uh, Caterin 15. You can see there are a couple of SNPs and they are strictly paternal. Uh, among uh, uh, all the consensus genes that we found that are imprinted, uh, that we found quite interesting, is BCL2 like 1, which is a gene involved in apoptosis, and Argonaut 2, which is involved in microRNA uh, metabolism. Uh, we already have obtained the conditional mutants for those genes and are trying to see whether indeed there is a, a, a specific role of the maternal versus the paternal allele in, in the expression of these genes. Um, this ox 3 is actually the example of the gene that I showed before. So you can see here this short transcript, and here these paternally expressed SNPs uh, located here. And this longer transcript here show exclusive maternal expression. And then here in the middle, uh, SNPs that are common between um, the short and the long transcript have uh, a moderate uh, maternal bias, um, but not as strong as the one here. So, um, uh, so these are for this gene. Another example is this one, H13, which is a peptidase, and you can see here again two short transcripts here uh, with unique SNPs to the three prime UTR are exclusively paternal, and here this longer transcript here um, that shows SNPs that are exclusively maternal. And then finally, another one, another example here in which uh, you have also these two transcripts with a three prime UTR that has SNPs that are exclusively mat maternally expressed, maternally expressed, and these SNPs here that are paternally expressed. And so there are a number of other genes that sh we show this complex phenomenon, astrotactin-1, interleukin-1, um, a dopamine decarboxylase and trap C9, which is a gene involved in mental retardation. So um, uh, we think that there's something really very profound here in which uh, some genes show some of their splicing variants being uh, um, uh, imprinted and, and not others. So how, what does that mean? Well, we don't know what that means. And I think this relate to um, the, the very uh, complex nature of transcription. Now, as people study uh, gene expression more and more using uh, RNA-seq, um, there is this um, phenomenal diversity of transcript that emerges, and people don't really know what to make of it. So um, Mike Greenberg was telling me a few months ago that the BDNF gene has as many as 48 different transcripts. Some of them are um, activity dependent, and some of them are not activity dependent. Why does the BDNF gene require 48 different transcripts? What differ between one transcript or the other? We don't know. In our case, what we found is that um, in the very large abundance of transcripts of certain genes, some actually show some paternal or maternal bias. It's possible that some, some of these transcripts are exclusively expressed by certain cell types, and those transcripts show uh, uh, imprinting, and some other transcripts are expressed by other cell types, and those are biolytic. Uh, alternatively, some of these transcripts might have specific function, and, and, and this is modulated through this phenomenon of genomic imprinting. So <clears throat> just to conclude, um, uh, what we've been looking at is, I think, a very interesting phenomenon that originates already at the level of the parental gametes. Um, and interestingly, right after fertilization, the paternal pronucleus is entirely demethylated except for the imprinted gene. So there's something with these uh, imprinting marks, uh, these epigenetic marks that actually uh, survive this uh, very deep wave of demethylation and then um, is likely to influence both the development of the embryo and then the function of the juvenile and then the adult brain. Now, uh, 
you know, there are quite a lot of questions that now can be raised by this uh, cycle of genomic imprinting, erasure, uh, etc. And <clears throat> one of them is obviously what is the different role of these virus imprintums? Why does the embryonic brain require to have a different set of imprinted genes than the adult brain? And why are two uh, adult um, brain area showing different imprintums uh, from each other. And, and those are really extremely interesting questions. I should point out that Mike Stryker very recently uh, published a paper in PNAS that showed that uh, EB3A, these genes that uh, causes uh, the Angelman syndrome, <coughs> is actually biallelic um, in, in the embryo uh, and even early postnatal life up to the time of the uh, critical period of visual development in which EV3A switches from becoming biallelic, from being biallelic to being purely maternal. And this switch is actually essential for the control of this uh, uh, critical period of uh, synaptic plasticity in the visual cortex. So uh, the changes in this imprintum could be uh, a very important for not only brain development, but even the maturation of the brain and, and changes in the brain in the adult. Obviously, <clears throat> a very interesting question uh, due to the very early nature of these epigenetic marks is whether anything uh, would occur during development that would change them. So whether uh, uh, the uh, environment in utero, for example, diet or stress, would have an effect on the final imprintum. This is particularly important, not only because uh, <clears throat> The, the embryo is in utero and therefore um, setting up this imprinting pattern could vary according to um, maternal diet, for example. But uh, even more interestingly, um, the primordial germ cells, so the future germ cells of, of this embryo here, so the F2 generation, are being set um, at E, E9, E10. Uh, in the mouse embryo. In other words, any change in the environment here, for example, lack of methyl group, could not only affect the imprinting of the embryo, but actually the imprinting, the imprinting marks of the gametes of this embryo, therefore even the next generation. <coughs> and then finally, you know, how does all of this work? <coughs> and, and this, I think we really don't know, and I think it's quite confusing. It's interesting and important to consider that every imprinted cluster that has been identified so far, each of them has a different mechanism to uh, um, uh, set up its own imprinting. So IGF-2 uses DNA methylation. IGF-2 receptor uses DNA methylation, but also require a non-coding RNA. But this gene, KCNQ1, actually does not require DNA methylation to maintain its imprinting. What it requires is a non-coding RNA, um, a polycom complex, and a specific set of histone modification. And the reason I show this cartoon that show all the type of um, chromatin modification that are known so far is I think genomic imprinting is no different than any other type of chromatin remodeling. The only difference um, is that it's a phenomenon that is allelic specific. And um, this is what non-coding RNA are very good for at providing allelic specificity to um, uh, epigenetic modification. And I think what's happening is that the phenomenon of genomic imprinting is a very interesting phenomenon because it's set very early, it affects many genes, and it's a way of basically shutting down the expression level by 50% or so of many genes in a particular cell type. So we'll just end by thanking Chris Gregg, the postdoc who's uh, led this work, he's a terrific, um, um, terrific scientist, and he was held by uh, Brady Weisberg, an undergraduate student, now Marilla Zierlinger, a postdoc, German Jung from Research Computing, and uh, our collaborator David Haig in Evolutionary Biology. Thank you very much. would happen if you gave to the mother during pregnancy androgens and whether the effect on the pups would be dependent on the, on the sex, whether they are males or females? 
Yeah, so <coughs> um, whether the sex-specific imprinting that we saw is uh, hormonal dependent, is, is that what your question is? Yeah. Yeah, it's a very good question. We've not done any of this. Um. Thank you. I'd like to know if there are any sex battle in the development of limbic system development. Of the limbic system? Yeah, the emotional behavior. I, I'm sorry, I'm not the, sure I understand the, limbic, the question. The limbic system of the brain. Right. The limbic system. But what, what do you want to know? Whether we... Whether, is there any, whether the sex battle is there. In well, the you know, the sex battle, yeah, according to our um, uh, um, survey of imprinted gene expression in the brain, the limbic system is one of the main target of imprinted gene expression. However, uh, we have not looked specifically at genomic imprinting in those particular brain areas. And so what we looked at is the expression of non-imprinted genes. And a posteriori, there's a huge caveat in this because those genes might very well not be imprinted. You know, they, are, they, are, uh, they have been described to be imprinted uh, in the literature, but uh, our data show that a gene that can be described to be imprinted in the embryo might actually not be imprinted in another brain area. So the simple answer to your question is, we would need to look specifically at those brain area and identify the set of imprinted genes. Um, you know, we didn't expect to find differences among the various brain areas. A posteriori, uh, if we had to do it again, would we have looked at specifically those brain area? Maybe not. Um, I think that uh, we, we might have looked, for example, at the arcuate nucleus, which is involved in feeding behavior, or we would have looked uh, um, at the amygdala or, or, or monoaminergic system. These are experiments that we're doing now, um, and so I don't know what the question is, but I suspect that there is. Thank you. <clears throat> so on uh, theoretical grounds, could you further stratify your imprinted genes by the ones where the reduction in level is the primary cause? as opposed to where sex bias is the primary cause? Um, I'm not sure I completely understand the question because um, um, there are a number of genes that see um, a difference of expression between the paternal and the maternal allele irrespective of whether the animal is a male or a female. And then there's a subset of gene that show a difference in maternal and paternal expression only in one sex and not the other? I, I, <clears throat> I don't think I asked that question. It's, so you mentioned at the end that imprinting in principle has the consequence that expression levels can be reduced by half. Right. Now, of course, there could also be an upregulation of the non-imprinted allele right. so that in the end the expression level would remain the same. Right. But let's assume that a good majority of the imprinted genes would have half the expression levels of the biallelic right. equivalent. Mm -mm. Now, that could be an evolutionary strategy, how to reduce the level of expression. Yeah, yeah. Another evolutionary strategy, namely the one that you mentioned in the bead, for instance, with respect to IGF-2 receptor and IGF-2, is that there is a battle going on right. between the maternal and the paternal allele, right. where expression level is kind of an epiphenomenon that then the expression levels would be reduced. Right. So could one separate on the, on the knowledge one has on the pathways of these genes groups that are only imprinted because the level has to be reduced as opposed to those that have to be imprinted because the uh, paternal or maternal uh, expression is important. I'm, I'm not sure why you're separating this because the reduction of the gene level is part of the battle. That's how the battle is fought, is by reducing gene expression. So, you know, the additional um, component um, of, of, the, of the strategy is um, it's not that dad does anything with IGF-2. Is actually mom shutting down her IGF-2 gene, right? So it's paternal express, it means that the action is actually on the maternal genome in shutting it down. Similarly, IGF-2 receptor is maternally expressed, 
And that is trying to make sure that, mo that, that there is no counteraction to IGF-2 by shutting down the IGF-2. So there is a little reversal here that you have to play with. Now, you know, the problem with this evolutionary consideration is that, you know, they work for a certain number of genes and we don't know whether they would work for other genes. What I can tell you is that among the genes, the largest gene category that we identify in the embryo um, are genes involved in metabolism. And so that kind of makes sense in the context of this, you know, embryonic growth and conflict between mom and dad. Um, I, I'm not sure I can go much further than that. You know, I'm not an evolutionary biologist, so I, I, it's difficult for me to defend evolutionary theory. I find it extremely interesting in the context of genomic imprinting. Uh, I think maybe other people should look actually at the list of genes and, and maybe do a more thorough analysis. I have a somewhat sim uh, more simple question. Did you find any microRNA genes being imprinted? Yeah, so among the non-coding RNA that we found, uh, a number of them are related to non-coding RNA. Actually, even in the um, prado willi cluster, uh, uh, at least one or two of them are, are microRNA. Yeah. We haven't looked much at non-coding RNA yet. Yes, I have something which is related to those points. So to me, it makes a lot of sense with parental conflict theory that you, uh, during embryonic development and even in newborn animals, like the, the male and the female parent will have uh, different demands on what the animal should do. But I don't really understand, like, what is the difference between the father's and the mother's um, objectives for the, for, the, for the animal as an adult? Like, so I don't really understand why imprinting is playing such a major role in the adult brain. And do you have any hints from looking at the function or the, the grouping of the adult imprinted genes? Well, for sure, uh, you, you can imagine that both at birth, when um, uh, for the pups, but also at the adult, there is also a conflict over nutrition. Uh, which is dad wants its progeny to uh, thrive as much as possible and, and mom, at least when um, um, she's, uh, the, the pups are, uh, before weaning, uh, mom wants to make sure they suckle but not too much, something like that. Um, afterwards, you know, I, I know that there are a number of evolutionary biologists that have all this like mathematical model of what mom and dad would want of their progeny. Uh, one that is sex specific uh, for sure is that um, you know the um, the son is a rival for dad and the daughter is a rival for mom and so what mom and dad would want their son and daughter to do are uh, certainly quite different but that's only for sex specific imprinted genes uh, for the other one you know I, I don't know I mean you know to some extent I have to say again the evolutionary theory provides a very nice background to that work, at least, you know, starting from embryonic development and maybe later on. Um, I am not the right person to have now a novel arcing theory of what uh, the evolution of imprinting in, in the adult brain. I found the phenomenon fascinating. The fact is, if there are 1,300 genes found imprinted in three brain regions, then if we look at 10 more brain regions, how many are we going to find? You know, it's just from uh, a, a gene regulation standpoint, it really is a very, seem to be a very fundamental uh, phenomenon in gene regulation. Yes. 